Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Tarram, the Executive Director of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. The Minnesota Justice Research Center focuses on research, education, and policy development. And our mission is really to transform the justice system in the state of Minnesota. Um, we believe that we can build a justice system shifted from just being a punitive criminal legal system to one that is more effective, one that is more humane, and that operates with the people's trust. Recently, we released our um, report uh, focusing on uh, trust of policing, the role of white supremacy, which we'll be digging into today, into this topic today with our, our guest, which I, who will introduce himself in a moment. And I want to say thank you for, to everyone for being here and helping us have this conversation as we really try to look for uh, concrete solutions that, that uh, affirm our shared values um, that we can then move forward uh, for concrete change by, by pulling the appropriate levers of power. Um, there's a poll that people are filling out, and I want to say thank you for filling out. Please, if you join us uh, late, please uh, go ahead and fill that out. And um, I will look to Katie to make sure I have any other uh, announcements. Am I good? And I'll just say this before I have our, our guests introduce themselves. It's been a, a ridiculous week in America. Um, you know, we sit just you know just a few days away from the opening arguments of the largest police misconduct trial since Rodney King. And at the same time, we're all mourning from uh, just madness and violence against the Asian community, uh, folks in Georgia. Uh, we also had another shooting in Colorado. But then this week, Minneapolis Police Department also was assaulted another young person in our community. And as we're trying to figure out and digest what all these things mean, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for joining us because in this space, we want this space to be a space where we can wrestle together and try to make meaning of the moment we're in, try to seize this opportunity to make sure that we move forward together as a community and as a state and as a country that feels that it can trust its systems, that feels that it can trust each other, that we can rely on each other in times of crisis and not just rely on systems for punitive responses when harm is done in our community. So thank you again for joining us. Um, I hope that you enjoy our time together. And uh, once again, this is the second conversation in a series of three. And so we hope to convene law enforcement um, after this conversation uh, to talk about white supremacy and policing and the of trust. Um, I will then now turn it to our esteemed panelists. Um, just one note, uh, Representative Paul Freight, Paul Novotny will be joining us later. So he's not on the call yet. Um, but I will turn it to our uh, guests to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Tracy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I speak to you from my office, in, my office in my house <laughs> um, in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and, you know, we're still constrained a lot in our movement um, due to the pandemic, although Connecticut um, now has, I think, the highest vaccination rate in, in the country, um, and our vice president is here today. Uh, so I, I will miss her because I'm speaking to you. <laughs> um, so uh, I am a law professor. I teach at Yale Law School, and I co-founded and co-direct the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School, where we um, think about um, theories of uh, system transformation, but also um, thinking about theories of what makes communities vital. Um, our motto is uh, serious science, serious impact. Uh, and um, I hope to uh, speak to you about some of our work today. Just a note, the uh, report that was uh, circulated by the Justice Center references the work of uh, my colleague and one of the Justice Collaboratory members, Philip Atiba Goff. So um, I'll be mentioning that too. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, Dr. Mears. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to be here. Um, I don't know that folks could have dragged me away from uh, President Kamala and so, uh, Vice President uh, Harris. Um, uh, and so uh, that means a lot to us. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ruland, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? 
Hello, my name is Ebony Ruland, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. However, um, I'm sure I can't see all the participants on this call, but I'm sure uh, many of you know me from Minnesota. Um, I worked at the Council on Crime and Justice, and then I also worked as the research director of the Robina Institute. Um, so Minnesota is definitely home. Uh, that's go Gophers, go Vikings. Um, so. Uh, worked many, many years in Minnesota, but now at the University of Cincinnati. So thank you for having me. It's so good to welcome you back, Evan. Um, thanks for taking time. In a lot of ways, the Council on Crime and Justice is our predecessor. And so it's great to continue this work together. Um, I will have uh, Representative Fraser, who um, I think may have, have to talk, uh, delay his um, introduction. Um, Representative Fraser, are you able to introduce yourself? I can I can go quickly. Uh, Representative Fraser, uh, representative in the Northwest suburbs in Minnesota. Um, freshman term as a legislator, but uh, this is a topic that I've been, um, I have a bill moving in our house right now on this issue. And I think it's a timely conversation. I'm glad to be here, be a part of this panel. Looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Representative Fraser. And, um, once again, we have uh, Representative Novotny will be joining us shortly. Uh, also on the call is, um, I won't have her introduce herself, is uh, Gina Evans, who's a board member with the Minnesota Justice Research Center and also a board member with the Second Chance Coalition. Um, but now I will turn it over to Kate, uh, Dr. Um, the DRC, as I like to refer to her, um, Dr. Katie Remington Cunningham, who is the res our research director at the MJRC, who wrote the report and it's gonna to facilitate today's conversation. And I'll, and before you speak, I just wanna give a shout out to Goldie Time, Black Owned Cafe, and Old School St. Paul, uh, where I'm hanging out this morning. And so um, if you get a chance to support Black business, please do. Katie, take it away. Thanks, Justin. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, so I'll be moderating our conversation and we're actually gonna start out with a few presentations from our um, research scholars. So I'm going to kick it right to you, Ebony, to get started. Um, and if you'd like to, to share your slides and um, both of our research scholars will talk for about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll engage in some conversation and reaction. I invite all of you to engage in this conversation as soon as um, you are moved to do so. You can ask questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and we will do our very best to address questions um, as we move forward. But we'll start out with those couple of presentations. Um, so, Ebony, if you want to jump in, I'm looking forward to hearing about your work. You're on mute. Sorry. My name again, Ebony Ruland, and I'm at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, but my research really focuses on police and community relationships. So I look at how the community trusts the police and if the police trust the community. Um, just a little bit of background of me. Uh, as I mentioned, much of my work has been done in Minnesota. Um, started looking at, started working on this issue in Minnesota, working on the racial disparities, traffic stops and studies uh, report, the statewide report that was released um, now many years ago. Uh, also working with Minneapolis Police Department to look at uh, traffic, racial disparities and traffic stops, as well as looking at the drivers of racial disparities worked on research looking at racial disparities and low level offenses. And then, as I mentioned, um, continuing to look at how uh, police and community re relationships can be improved. Uh, my work focus is still in Minnesota, as well as um, in Cincinnati. So I wanted to just start with this slide by the Prison Policy in um, Initiative using data from BJS. And this really shapes how um, people interact, I guess, with the police officer, with police officers by race. So this slide illustrates, or this um, figure illustrates that black people are disproportionately stopped by, on the street by police, whereas white people, white individuals are more likely to call the police from, for help. And so these interactions and how we utilize police and how we encounter police and come in contact with police can really shape um, our experiences and shape our viewpoints. So where white individuals are likely to see them as somebody who can help them, black individuals disproportionately come in contact with them through being stopped, questioned, or maybe even accused of a crime. 
So that can impact then the trust um, between community and police. Oftentimes we talk about community trust and community, does the community trust the police? Um, I'm not sure that we talk enough about police also trusting the community. So my research shows that often community doesn't trust the police, but the police doesn't trust certain communities as well. And one of my big things too is being very precise and when we're talking about community, because oftentimes we say community and policing, community trust, but what communities? And so my communities or the communities that I focus on are typically African-American communities um, that may experience um, more calls for service, more uh, police responses. So we also need to be crystal clear when we're talking about communities, what communities we're talking about because in other communities, policing is done differently and there is the trust amongst uh, police and community. And so this, these two quotes just illustrate how one community member, um, and these quotes, this study was actually conducted in Minneapolis, North Minneapolis specifically, where I looked at uh, police and community relationships. And the first um, bubble is a community member saying, you know, how do you build trust with somebody who has this preconceived idea of who you are? So this idea that uh, police are judging community members because of the neighborhoods or the communities that they live in. And so because they feel like police have this preconceived notion that um, you know, they're literally of a partnership with police. And if you look at the bottom quote, this is from a police officer uh, from a, a police department in Minnesota where they're saying you know, that the community also has these preconceived notions. They are coming to the table to have uh, you know, a constructive community conversation, but oftentimes community has um, these closed minds and um, these preconceived ideas. And so it just leads to not really accomplishing much. So this, the purpose of this is to really illustrate how community sometimes or often doesn't trust um, police, but police also have difficulty trusting community. And some concerns are that um, in, with communities that I focus on, again, uh, predominantly African-American um, communities that experience uh, pl high policing is the concerns of over-policing and under-policing. So in one sense, they're over-policed, over-policed um, for you know, low level uh, offenses for traffic stops, um, so they're routinely being stopped. They are routinely being searched, even though they're less likely to have contraband um, than white individuals. We saw policies like stop and frisk in other communities. So they're experiencing over-policing, especially of these uh, zero tolerance hotspots um, sort of policing. But in another sense, they're experiencing under-policing. So um, they might be experiencing uh, where they're experiencing violent crimes or robberies and, and calling the police, um, but feeling like the response times are longer, um, that the, there's not a lot of prevention efforts. Um, one study that I worked on, they said that officers, they'll put shot spot, like shot spotters in, and that's a technology to identify gun detection, uh, but there's not the actual work on the ground to prevent crime. Um, so then it's just sort of throwing these surveillance techniques in, but not doing the actual work and community engagement. And then when they do call the police, um, concerns over response time, but also concerns over interactions that the police then treat them as sus suspects or that um, they're rude to them or um, not fully listening to them. And so in my research, their community members often have a need for the police and, and often want the police in their community, but they just want the police to change their tactics, to change their interactions, to not mean mug them as one person said, to um, you know, talk to them, to communicate with them, to see them as humans. And uh, there has been some research to show that procedural justice might be one ways in which police can improve interactions with the community. But I also want to highlight all the things that the police are tasked with doing. So the police are tasked with often um, addressing the very low level minor issues from parking issues all the way to the serious homicides. And so I say that to say that you know, maybe police are tasked with too much and maybe um, there, this is the time to be having conversations about are there other entities 
um, other social service, mental health, what have you, that can respond to certain number of calls and we leave policing to respond to those higher you know, homicides, robberies, burglaries. Uh, so I think we do have to have conversations about all the things we are tasking officers to respond to um, and with the hope of then improving uh, relationships by having maybe other entities solve issues, but also reducing the burden on officers as well. So I know that was really quick, but I wanted to keep it short so that we could have uh, further conversation and discussion. So I'll stop sharing now. Awesome, thank you so much, Ebony. This is, um, even as someone who's digging into this research myself, it's always fascinating to hear your perspective on this work and even to always see quotes like that, I think can be the most moving um, when you're sometimes buried in the numbers to really just see what do community members say, what do they feel in regards to trust? And on the same side, uh, what do police feel and say? So Tracy, if you wanna um, jump right in and share a, a little bit of your work with us. Yeah. Um... I really appreciate um, the things that Dr. Ruland was saying, and um, I had pre some prepared remarks, uh, but I'm going to modify them a little bit, actually, to respond to some of the things uh, that she was saying, and I think in a way that will advance the conversation. So I wanted to make three points, one about racial disparity, um, which definitely connects with some of uh, Dr. Ruland's presentation. Um, second, I want to say something about the social psychology of how people come to conclusions about the, the fairness of legal authorities that include police. That's one way of understanding what it means um, to talk about community trust. Uh, and I want to say something about um, how we might understand a community member's demand for safety uh, and the role that the state can or should play in that, which again, connects up with um, the, the last point. Um, and in the midst of it, uh, I hope to say something about your report um, on white supremacy, but I'm not sure I can get all of these points in, in my 10 minutes. Okay, um, so the first point is about racial disparity. And um, you know there is clearly extensive evidence that black, brown, and indigenous people in this country are more likely to engage with, uh, be processed by, and ultimately punished by various components of the criminal legal system and the authorities who lead and comprise uh, those components. This is a critically important issue, um, but I, I think interestingly, some people, and, and in mentioning disparities and connecting with Dr. Ruland's uh, presentation, I don't think she makes this mistake at all. Uh, but many people will say, well, the goal or one of our important goals should just be to reduce these disparities. And, and that would help us to better understand um, trust. And, and I think that overlooks um, two things. The first that he said it overlooks is just pointing out disparities doesn't really adequately recognize the fact that too many people, no matter who they are and what demographic group they're from, um, engage with this system. And they do because we have decided either explicitly or as a result of no plan at all really to pursue a path in which safety for the public depends on carceral logic. And theory is pretty clear that this approach is neither necessary nor optimal. Uh, we can pursue safety uh, without having to invest our resources primarily in the face of the state uh, concerned with force. And a first step to doing that work is to listen to what the people who feel the brunt of violence in their neighborhoods and also the state's response to that problem. Um, and the state's response to that problem is typically armed general purpose first responders tell us uh, what it is uh, they feel they need uh, to feel safe. And that's the part I'm going to get to in, in, at the end. Um, but the, the, the reason to start there is that an important principle of procedural justice, which Dr. Rillen mentioned, um, which I have studied for almost two decades, uh, concerns providing people with voice, listening to their perspectives, seeking their input for policy, and making sure in specific interactions with authorities to provide uh, those people with an opportunity to share their side of the situation. Uh, procedural justice is a theory of social psychology 
Um, it's concerned with how people come to conclusions about the fairness of legal authorities, such as police, judges, and other actors. Uh, but to be clear, this theory generalizes well beyond criminal legal system actors. And it's important to understand when people talk about uh, procedural justice that, you know, they'll say, well, um, you know, one answer to these issues is, you know, to train police on procedural justice. It's not a training program. <laughs> it's not specifically narrow. It is a general theory of social psychology about how people understand fairness, which ranges from legal actors to, in fact, even how parents interact with their kids. It's not a training program. It is a conceptual framework. OK, so we really need to, to understand that that point. Um, it is importantly concerned with legitimation, when and how people engage and cooperate with authorities and follow laws and rules. Um, those are the, the three things uh, that we're worried about, cooperation, engagement and and following rules, of course. But that's probably the least important point. Um, and research shows that procedural justice is a key component of public legitimacy. Four factors matter. I've already mentioned one, voice. Um, in addition to be ta being taken seriously and listened to, people desire to be treated with dignity, respect for their rights, and with politeness. That's the second factor. Um, but there are another two factors that really matter a lot. Uh, people care a great deal about the fairness of decision-making by authorities. So with respect to decision-making fairness, people look to indicia of decision-maker neutrality, objectivity, and factuality in decision-making. Can one can actually connect the facts of what happens to the decisions and an authority is imposing? Um, consistency in decision-making, transparency. And finally, people care about being able to assess whether the motives of the authority they're dealing with, whether it's cops, judges, prosecutors, state representatives, um, whether they're trustworthy. For example, it is important in an interaction with a member of the public that an illegal authority takes the time to explain what they're doing in order to help the person ascertain whether the motivations of that authority is sincere, benevolent, benevolent, excuse me, uh, and well-intentioned. Uh, you know, basically it boils down to this. Members of the public want to believe that the authority that they are dealing with believes that they count. And they make that assessment based on how they're being treated and their interactions with the authority. And that matters much more to them than outcomes that that pro authority produces. So now I'm gonna go back briefly uh, to the report um, that, um, that you all uh, distributed because there was a, a, a graph about trust in that report also showed a racial ga gap in that trust. And for a very long time, police would say that um, of course, trust should be a function of the outcomes they produce for the community. Now notice that graph that you saw Trust is flat across the three decades of an extreme climb to crime decline. Now, if it is the case, and I've actually given this presentation literally to fifth graders, okay? <laughs> if it turns out that people are actually motivated to trust police more by the outcomes they produce, that is a crime decline. When I ask the fifth graders, well, what would you expect to see uh, in the trust graph? And the fifth graders came up to the blackboard and said, well, it should go up. And then I showed them the same exact graph that you all produced. And I showed them that it was flat and that there was an extreme racial gap. So I asked the fifth graders, well, what do you think's going on then? And they said, well, Professor Mears, it must be that trust has nothing to do with the crime to crime. That's a conclusion of a fifth grader. Now, obviously, it's probably an overstatement to say that it has nothing to do with it, but it is, I think, fair to say that there is a disconnect, which is another piece of evidence that supports the, the theory that I um, was explicating before. And I think I only have a couple of more minutes. So here's what I wanna end with, right? So what does matter? In addition to the things that I mentioned, what is it that people want? 
If you ask people about what they want in order to feel safe, um, they want the kind of security from private violence in their communities, absolutely. But they also want to be secure from government overreach. And they're not getting that now. They also want basic public goods. They want secure housing. They want food security. They want decent education. They want health care. They want the basic public goods of citizenship in order to feel safe. And what they get from the state is armed general purpose first responders who come in the midst of emergency and extremists. That's not safety. Last point, when you're thinking about these basic public goods, it is important to understand that these are things that the state can, and to my mind, must provide. So in the arguments around defunding and so on, when people are talking about community provision of certain aspects of safety, um, I do think it's possible um, for some of that to, to happen. But once we start talking about what community is doing without thinking about the state's obligation in this regard, right? we are talking about private provision of public goods to which many members of other communities, wealthier communities have had state support for decades. And that's not fair. That's it. Did I go over time? Okay. I'll get to white supremacy later. No, I'm just uh, taking notes and my head, I'm my head spinning because you've said both of you have made such critical points. Um, and I think, you know, in our report, this is always the case. You're both researchers with anytime you write, you're like, oh, I wish I could have dug into procedural justice more or if I had more space. You know, these are all things that we've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I think your point about um, voice really resonates with us at the Justice Research Center. Some of the, a lot of the work that we really focus on doing is trying to um, at least really get and in, dig into that uh, first piece of listening to folks and making sure we understand what it looks like and what, you know, what pieces are needed for safety, for justice more broadly. Um, so what I want to do um, is I'd love, uh, Representative Nambotny, thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, we, uh, before we got started, we had all of our panelists just briefly introduce themselves, who they are, sort of their role. Um, so I'll invite you to do that. And then if you'd like, I'll, I'll invite you to just um, jump right into your response to um, the presentation. So, you know, my, my kind of prompt or question is, what about um, these two presentations maybe surprised you and what didn't surprise you? And how does this connect to how you think about your work? And then I'll ask the same for you, Representative Frazier, afterwards. Uh, well, my name is Paul Mabadi. I'm a state representative out of District 30A, which is uh, over in the Big Lake uh, area. So I'm uh, a farm kid that uh, stayed in Elk River and it's become a suburb served for 33 years as a deputy sheriff in various positions and retired as a, as a sergeant from the Sherman County Sheriff's Office. Uh, was elected in February 2020 uh, to in a special election and now uh, in my second, my first full term. Um, so just a little over a year here in the legislature. Um, if you want to get right into the, so I, uh, Representative Frazier and I were on a, on a committee uh, before this, you know, uh, as they started. So the only thing I've been able to hear is the testimony of Ms. Mears. And uh, my reaction was, yes. Uh, so many things she was hitting on are, are things that uh, I absolutely agree with and, and things about what, what's going on um, and how do we make this better and move forward. Um, there's universal truths that she's saying, and, and it doesn't matter who you are or what community you're serving, the, the way you're treated and, and having that respect from the people that you're serving is very important. I, I will tell you that one of my, uh, uh, went to a homicide investigation class and the, the instructor wrote on a board, it was all the letters and I, for, you know, for, I can't do the letters in my head, but, but uh, the, the, message was get off your ass go knock on doors 
um, get out of the office, go make the contact with people. People would be so happy that you bothered to show up and check with some neighbors and you know, make an effort as opposed to um, just solving the crime. You know, uh, to know, you know, and it's, it's, it's a much overused, uh, uh, well, I guess you can't use it too much. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. And that is a universal truth uh, along everything in law enforcement, no matter where you are in the state. Um, we were talking about what to do different and, and how to get involved. Cause I was just crazy taking notes as she was talking. Cause it's like, yes, that, that thing, what can we do different? Make that contact. Um, I know I talked with uh, Justin last week and part of the, problem that I see right now with law enforcement in the metro areas is think of it as, as uh, if you put it in the context of firefighting, right now, all they can do is try to fight fires. They can't do any fire prevention. And it, and it doesn't matter where you are or whatever community you're serving. If you don't have that time, unassigned time, that you can go out and let people know that you care, um, then you're not gonna have that opportunity to build those relationships and build the trust. And finally, I know we're, we're pushing for time here, but uh, one of the things I expressed is get involved. You, if you think of the police department as your employees, you want them to work the way you want them to do and treat people like you want to be treated. And that's, if you step back to a, a small community like Sherburne County where I work, um, I always told young guys, look, you can do your job. Arrest people that need to be arrested. Don't arrest people that don't need to be arrested. But if you're a jerk, I'll know about it. You know, it's a small community, couple couple degrees of separation. Um, you know, if you were a jerk to someone, their brother plays softball with my friend from high school's nephew, I'll hear about it right away. And that's how people, you know, so as I expressed in, in previous calls, and look, I've arrested cops, I've arrested legislators, I've arrested my cousin, I've arrested um, best friends, kids. If long as they're treated with respect and they know that they need to go to answer for what they did and you're not making it an us versus them, that that's half the battle. So treat people the way you wanna be treated and, and go to that. So. Long term, I would hope that there's more involvement and there's more conversations that can be had because that's how we start um, changing our thoughts. Now, I, I look at Representative Frazier. We've been serving together for three and a half months. Most of the time in the same building, we've never had a face-to-face -face meeting. <laughs> you know, we're in different floors right now. We'd have to go outside to have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so. Um, that's just what I'm, I'm hoping for and that we continue these conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And you, you, you joined us after Dr. Rulin spoke, but she had mentioned a few of the points that you made about sort of police trusting community and community trusting police, the sort of two-way street um, of respect there. Representative Frazier, I'd love to hear your kind of quick reactions to uh, the presentations. Uh, we'll be quick, uh, uh, but Representative Novotny, not for lack of trying, we have been trying to get together. <laughs> Um, you know, to make those connections very hard in this virtual world. Um, you know, much to what Representative Novotny said, I mean, I, I think that, you know, that community policing piece we've been talking about for a long time. What I heard from Dr. Mears uh, with those, with the numbers around disparities is not surprising to me, none of that's surprising to me. And I think that's that's what we're trying to get past, right? We, we talked about community policing, we have these ideas of how we can make and build relationships and make things better. But the fact of the matter is we still have these disparities. I mean, we still have situations that are happening that led us to where we are now with a trial for a police officer that uh, killed an individual that probably not should have been, that should not have been restrained in that manner for such a long period of 
of time. And, and that is the thing that continues to destroy the trust of our communities when we continue to have events like that. So when we talk about community policing, if we're gonna do it, we have to do it well. And we have to be able to uh, create situations where our officers are engage engaging with community members. Like Representative Novotny said, you know, you arrest those that need to be arrested. But not everybody needs to be arrested. Not everyone needs to be restrained in a manner that is going to put harm, bring harm to their bodies or, or cause them to die. And I think those are the situations that continue to put us back. We, we can take us, we may take a half a step forward, but we continue to take 20 steps back every time we have a situation like the one we had with George Floyd. So a lot of my focus, what I'm focusing on since I've been a legislator is how do we put policies in place that can make those uh, those interactions less likely? And specifically less likely when it comes to the communities that have had the disproportionate in, uh, interactions that Dr. Mears and Ruan talked about. And that's that's what I really want to focus on. I, I, I Both of the presentations were great. I think this is a timely conversation considering the moment that we're in right now, particularly in the state of Minnesota. But I do want to leave some time because I want to hear Dr. Mears talk about the white supremacy piece because I do have a bill that is focused on trying to help to create that trust and build that trust back um, in a way that I think that can help the community. So I want to hear her thoughts on that and, and the rest of the panel also. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Thanks so much, Representative Fraser. I think it's a it's a good segue to um, to uh, a couple of questions that I have. So we held a conversation last week with leaders from our community organizations um, here in Minnesota, from the NAACP, the Council of Minnesotans on, of African Heritage, and the Urban League, um, and the Black Civic Network. And much of our conversation last week really focused on whether um, and how, and even if communities of color ever really could or should trust police as we currently uh, know that they function. So, so one question, um, and and we we really dug into to um, historical understandings and to sort of foundations for law enforcement, in particular considering the role of white supremacy. So, I would love to to first kind of direct the question to our um, research scholars. So, why why did you choose? And and as a um, an academic myself, I know sometimes you don't always choose your research path. But why why do you study and choose to focus your research in the space of police community relations? And and what do you feel is the importance of trust? Again, really considering sort of historical foundational notions of what policing is in this country. Um, so either of you can jump in first, but I would love to hear sort of the research pr perspective first. Do you want me to go first? I don't. Okay. That'd be great. Well, I, I, I have been doing it a little bit longer than you have. <laughs> um, I've been a professor for 28 years. Um, and my work actually began looking at um, the intersection of sociology and law, how to think about um, reducing violence in a context in which the standard approach was built on a law and economics framework treating people as um, individual rational actors, that a get tough approach to crime was going to be the best way to address violence. I mean, this is back probably before you were born, Ebony, I don't know, <laughs> in, in the mid nineties, you know, just for visibility, I'm 54. So you, you can understand like what we're talking about here. Um, and um, my contribution was to look at the sociology of neighborhoods and to think about how um, neighborhood structure could address violence reduction. So, you know, I'm not sure if there is one in, in Minneapolis, but the, you know, there's programs on on ceasefire and um, you know having um, street workers and stuff. Trying to figure out you know a legal architecture for for thinking about that was the emphasis of my work. And from there, actually turned to psychology because I wanted to understand basic ideas about compliance with the law. Um, you know, because again, the law and economics of it is people will obey the law because they fear the consequences of failing to do so. So the strategy is to get tough, but the social psychology of procedural justice and legitimation tells you that most people obey the law most of the time. This is like standard, right? Your well, most, quote unquote, hardened criminal, it's not a phrase I use, which is why it's like this, stops at stoplights. Let me just say that again. <laughs> the most hardened criminal stops at stoplights, doesn't shoplift, so on, right? So what does that tell you, right? What we need to do is to think about ways 
to encourage people to internalize rule compliance. Um, and that's what took me to the, the social psychology of procedural justice and a focus on police in particular, because they are the legal authorities with whom most members of the public have the most contact all of the time. Um, now they're not the only ones, right? But that, that's the reason for focusing on that. So you asked for the genealogy, that's it. Super helpful. So um, before I start on my point of how I got into this, I think that rule compliance uh, piece is really interesting because I think in one sense, I think that is absolutely correct. I think in another sense, I think there's been work by, or there has been work by Emily Baxter that we are all criminals. And I think that there are so many rules in our society that we just don't know. I mean, when I'm driving, I'm sure I break like 20 traffic things when I'm driving because we just, we, we forget, we do, you know, we don't know. And so I think that some of those things are then policed differently. So I think that there is this inherent to ob obey the law, but there are times when I'm sure I forget to turn my blinker on. And then that can be used as a way to stop people and then to search people. So I think that that's also, you know, the rule compliance, but with the, we all, we are all criminals at the end of the day as well. Um, and so my trajectory into this is, uh, really when I started at the Council on Crime and Justice studying racial disparities in traffic stops and really interested in what were the drivers of racial disparities? What were causing these racial disparities? Why were we seeing such differences uh, between whites and blacks, but also between Native, uh, Native American communities as well? And one of the things that I am very interested in is the policy piece. So I think that it's interesting and um, I heard the representative say that introducing policies but I also think policies can only go so far because the departments that I have worked with even I would say uh, you know Chief Rondo I think we're doing some of these things before the incident happened we're, we're engaging in how do you make policing better had policies um, and, and was really and, and this is true for police chiefs across the country, but it takes that one incident, as um, the representative said, to, you know, uh, destroy everything that has been done. But I also think policy can only take us so far because there's a culture. There's a culture of policing. There's a culture. And so and if we don't address that cultural, the culture of policing, and if we don't address the historical relationships between the police and the community, then it, I'm sort of skeptical about policies. I, I don't know that policy will push us forward. Um, and so that's what really drives me and really motivates me is how do we get underneath this? How do we get at the drivers to really get at the root causes um, to sustain um, this issue, to sustain change and reforms? I think this is a great um, segue to kick it to our policy makers, um, because I think it's something, it's a question that we've also grappled with as we're thinking about how do we move in this space. And so I would love to hear from both representatives, how do you think about um, this broader value of trust, you know, it, as policy, like, can we use policy to increase something like trust? Is that an important space to, to work? And then also, again, you know, I really, um, I invite you just to circle back to the to the question of racial disparities and to this notion um, of both sort of broader institutional white supremacy and some of the explicit examples that we brought up in our report. You know, I think that this is something this is something we're thinking a lot about. So I would just love to hear your thoughts on on how you all think about your work in the policy space, really addressing this issue, sort of if and how. I think. I can I can I can try first. Um, I think policy can play a big uh, role in reducing these disparities. I mean, I'll just give the example that the white supremacy bill I'm carrying, essentially what it does is it allows for our licensing board to um, ban individuals that are affiliated with white supremacists or, or hateful extremist groups um, from being in law enforcement. I think that goes along when you talk, when you, when you connect that with the, with the data um, and the presentation that were just provided to talk about those negative interactions that are happening between communities, you know, particularly communities, our BIPOC communities or communities of color, um, much of that, that many individuals from, from our communities, they view that as these individuals, most of the cops um, don't look like them and they view it as these cops have a negative connotation 
of who they are, how they live and what their culture is. And they believe that causes these, and it, and it does, it causes these negative interactions. When we talk about that trust piece, uh, this bill or policy was specifically what it would do is it would, it would, it would signal to the community. We're trying to root that out to make sure that individuals that are in law enforcement are not associated with these groups, are not affiliated with groups that have a belief that that um, you are somehow less than, that community members that they're policing are somehow less than. And I think that goes a long way in building trust, and it can help bring down and help close the gap on those disparities. But that is only that is only one thing. I mean, there's there's plenty of other things. I'm sure Representative Novotny is going to be able to touch on as well, but that is one way policy can make a difference. And I, I truly believe that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be in a policy making position is that policy is a place that can make can make a difference. Um, it is many, much much of our policy or many of our policies have led us here to these disparities, disparities, which is the way these systems are designed. So absolutely, we can make a difference in the policy realm. Uh, yeah. I I know on the bill that uh, Representative Frazier presented, um, you know, there was discussion on that. Um, my, so how does policy relate to it from my side? Um, the bill was, we need to have the conversations and, and there needs to be uh, a recognition that, I, I call it the flip side argument. So, if you can't present a bill or say something that uh, if somebody was to type it out and flip the identifying characteristics in the bill, would you be still in support of it? Or if it, would you be upset if that was, was said? Um, I, I believe that we should strengthen the post boards for screenings for anyone to pay and make sure that anyone for any reason that comes to the job with, with hate in their heart, or if something happens or that changes while they're serving, you know, let's face it, this is a 25 to 35 year uh, experience over which time people will see hundreds, if not thousands of uh, violent uh, crimes or the, the fallout from these thousands of crimes and, and, and all these interactions, people will change no matter who they are. So I, I, if we acknowledge that there is uh, white supremacy, but that's not enough, let's look at the whole picture and make sure the whole picture gets fixed. Um, and that would be my, my, stand, my take on, on that. Great, thank you. So um, lots of thoughts on, on policy and sort of how we frame it and, and you know, thinking about the problem at hand here. I do, I am mindful of time, so I do wanna ask um, one more question kind of connected to, to our report and then I'll kick it to Gina for a question from the audience. So um, our report finishes with, with sort of four recommendations. So we say we need to really talk honestly about this issue and, and the specific issue of white supremacy in, in policing. We need to collect more data broadly on race and policing. Um, we need to make attempts. We need to do like, you know, as, as Representative Frazier is, is attempting with his policy and his bill, we need to try something. And then finally, we need to really evaluate our attempts and our progress to sort of just determine if they're working. So I would love to just hear from anyone who'd like to jump in, like of those four recommendation, what really jumps out to you in your work um, as sort of being a place to start or where, what, what resonates best with you in that space? Is this a question for Ebony and me? And anyone for all four of you. So oh, right. okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. So let me just say a couple of things. How much time do we have? Because I just want to make sure I'm very pointed. About seven minutes. Okay. Um, one of the things that I find a little frustrating in this context is the uh, approach that I question I get from lots of journalists, which kind of echoes what you just said. Um, like, what's the best? What are the three best? What's your top priority? Look, this is an ecology. It is an ecosystem of supremacy. It just is. And what you need to understand is that while the basics of the theory that I laid out, that both representatives, Paul Novotny and Cedric Fraser, I looked you up, sorry, I didn't know any either of you. So we have a Republican and a Democrat agree on is 
um, the universality of the uh, dictates of fairness. That's what my research shows. That's true. And what that would suggest is that if it is universal, that not only do I want that for myself, but I want that for people who are not like me. Okay. There is also a social psychology of intergroup relations. And that social psychology is very re much related to this, these ideas of white supremacy. There is a long history showing research on aversive racism, people who have very um, have commitments to egalitarianism. There is a long history, but and yet still engage in acts that undermine um, these uh, commitments to fairness. There is a long decades of research on social dominance orientation, again, inconsistent with the universality of fairness. And that research shows the ways in which people will tend to see um, Black boys as older than they are. They'll tend to see Black people as more dangerous than they are, that will tend to want to punish Black people more than white people, even while committing to the universality of the dictates of fairness that I just said. What does that tell you? It tells you that this is all about the wolf we feed. Which one are we going to feed? Are we going to feed the wolf that is supporting justice and fairness? Or are we going to feed the wolf that is about social dominance, that is about um, you know, seeing Black people as dangerous, and, and so on? We got to pick. And the one that the wolf that we pick is going to require an entire ecosystem. One thing is not enough. I'm sorry I spoke too much, but you know, this isn't just about hate in somebody's heart. It is the air that we breathe. And I've got lots of research that while other people are talking, I will happily put it in the chat because this isn't just things I believe. It is stuff I have researched for 28 years in my career. Thank you. No, I appreciate um, I, I appreciate your response, and I think it's an important one because I think sometimes, and I'd love you know representatives' quick comment on this, but sometimes in when um, you know you're pushed for action, it's like pick a thing, act on it, pick one thing, and we live in a very complex world um, in which we we can't always do that. So I'd love to hear just Representative Not and, and Fraser your reactions, um, and then we're going to go to Gina for the last couple minutes for a last question. Just yeah, just quickly, uh, Dr. Beers. Absolutely spot on. Check, check, check. Um, data. That data point is is important, right? We should be making decisions based on what the data tells us and what the studies have shown us is is true. Um, and I'll just go back to the reason I brought this white supremacy bill is because we've got tons of data. We've got an FBI report done from 2016 to 2020 that says that this is an imminent threat in our law enforcement right now. And I, I'm, I'm always one to say, we need to get to the root cause of things. So this is an immediate priority for me because it's, it's an imminent threat. Our FBI intelligence folks have identified that. Um, they showed what the connections are. And I wanna make sure that we have the opportunity to, to root that out um, because it is something that we know right now that is very harmful and we can see it. It's right there. We're being, warning signs are going off and we should do something about it. And that's, that's connecting back to that data piece. And I picked that because it is a data piece that we can access concrete and right there in front of us. But Dr. Mears, I'm looking forward to talking to you more because I want to use that data in, in further policy decisions. So um, we've only got a, a couple of minutes left. Gina, if you want to read one of the questions that was asked from the audience, that was a good one. And then we'll um, hopefully ask the panelists to stay on for like one or two minutes after 1030, just so we can. Um, both of the questions, interestingly enough, are about education. And so um, I think, um, I think I'm going to go with the college question. So Minnesota colleges who train uh, most uh, Minnesota police officers recently announced a change to curriculum. Um, so what, to what extent do you believe this change might affect policing attitudes and community engagement with police relationships in the long term? I think I'll grab that uh, and then I'm going to have to get off for the next committee meeting. But uh, this is one of the things I spoke about with Terrell last week is that that need to uh, grow your own, you know, your crop. Uh, the community service programs, community service officers, explore programs if they're there. Um, and I, I won't have time to go into it, but I, I think getting community resource officers back into the schools 
That's one of the places you can have those, those uh, positive relationships built. I think uh, too often, and this is a, not a racial thing because they dealt with it with principals. They used the community, the, the school liaison officers for enforcement of minor things that shouldn't be police issues. The police should be there to protect the students as their first priorities. And uh, that would be one of the things I would do long-term for schooling. Great, thank you so much. And I know uh, Representative Fraser just said he had to jump to a meeting. So you know, if you have to jump, please do. We appreciate the time that you've taken. Um, I'm gonna kick it actually to Gina at the end here to sort of wrap up for us, but I'm so grateful for this conversation as always in these spaces, never enough time, uh, never enough space to really dig into each issue. Um, but we hope that at the very minimum, this, um, this piques folks' interest in really engaging in the conversation, engaging in the issues, digging into the work um, that Professor Mears and Dr. Rowland have done and really sort of learning more um, and, and then reaching out to your representatives to ask questions and, and sort of move forward further. So um, Gina, if you wanna wrap it up for us, that would be great. Um, thank you. Um, uh, like Justin said, my name is Gina Evans and I'm a proud member of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. Thank you all for being a part of the conversation today. Um, from the beginning of this organization, our founder, Tom Johnson, and this board had many conversations about how we, um, we all, community lawmakers and law enforcement have shared values of safety and trust. We discussed that solutions to complex issues like mass incarceration and policing could come out of community conversations just like this one. I believe that he would be proud of this work. MNJRC is a 501c3 nonprofit that relies on community organizations and generous donors like some of you to keep doing this very important work. Dr. Remington Cunningham is a part-time director of research and our goal this year is to bring her on full-time. Um, there's so much work to do. So please give if you are able um, at mnjrc.org um, and uh, backslash support. There's a big giant donate button. So if you wanna click on that and um, give if you're able to do that. Additionally, um, if you have a resource, research project or a program evaluation that you'd like to partner with us on, please reach out to Justin or Katie. Um, uh, we uh, are looking at other projects to, to do. Um, and again, thank you for being here today. Uh, we look and look for our next trust in policing, continuing the conversation. We're going to be inviting members of law enforcement to come respond to our report. Um, we're going to be looking at that this week or this next week and inviting um, some other folks to come. So thank you again for jo joining us and enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, so folks, uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to click on some of the links that Professor Mears has put in, we'll, we'll grab the chat, we'll grab all of this information and we'll in ensure that we're sharing it with folks so we can continue to learn, continue to engage in this conversation. Um, but again, thank you. And Justin, if you wanna have the last word before we jump off. Sorry about that. I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say other than thank you, thank you, and thank you. This was an amazing conversation, exactly what we're looking for at the MNJRC. I have different perspectives from different places, like looking at how we can all try to get on the same page and identify some shared values around this subject. And I'm humbled by the talent on this call. Uh, Dr. Mears, thank you so much for, for passing up on a meeting with the vice president uh, to be here. Um, but obviously, the folks in Minnesota, like we, we need your expertise. We need we need your attention on this subject as we are about to go through another difficult time uh, this summer. And so, uh, keep our community in mind. Uh, Representative Fraser would like to follow up with you. I'll connect you with uh, Representative Lotney as well if you're interested. Ebony, the same offer goes to you and the same level of gratitude. Thank you for coming home, even if it's just virtual for a moment. Uh, we always welcome you. And then um, I would just echo just my appreciation for the DRC. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Remington Cunningham. Uh, thank you so much for all your work on the report. Gina, great, great, uh, great request to the community. I'll just echo that. We're a nonprofit with a team of two, and um, any support folks can give our can give can throw our way will help us, you know, be able to expand our capacity so we stop making mistakes on Twitter and <laughs> make sure that we get the right information out there. Um, so thank you for all the support and um, enjoy the rest of your Friday and uh, keep our city in your prayers and thoughts 
um, and we'll get through this time together. Peace and blessings.